Okay. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for attending. Tonight, you have the pleasure of listening to Dr. Jolly share his great wisdom with you. Tonight, he wants to share with you uh, how to explore the great gift of our body. Our tool for exploring the physical phase of life, learn to appreciate and care for this incredible vehicle that is our great gift. Learn how to use it for the highest level of life, energy, vitality, happiness, and fulfillment. Learn what to do and what not to do to nurture this gift, and to also explore the component of spirit that animates the body. Keep the body functioning at the highest level, experience greater health, joy, love, meaning and purpose. No further ado, Dr. Jolly. All right, good evening everyone. Thanks Justin very much. Let me get wired up here. Okay, so welcome to all of you who are in-house and those who are out-house, so to speak. I want to talk tonight about this vehicle called the human body. It is an incredible gift, and I'm going to tell you about the spiritual possibility about that gift. But before I do that, I want to give you a question that I want you to ponder and be able to answer. How many of you have ever bought a car? All right? Bought a car? How many of you ever bought a car in a teeny-weeny box this big, an inch by an inch square, and took it home, took it out of the box, put it in the house, and watched it grow into a full-size car that would hold six people and a lot of luggage and take you anywhere you wanted to go. How many of you ever did that? Anybody? Nobody ever did that? You never bought a car in a little box and watched it grow? Never did? I'm astounded. Let me tell you something. We are absolutely incredible beings. We are start out so small that 500,000 of us, 500,000 fertilized human eggs can fit on one half of a dime. One half of a dime. And from that, what happens to us? We grow. We become what we are. Our organs are formed. Magnificent things happen in our bodies that we don't think about, we don't even know about most of the time, we are absolutely incredible, unfathomable, unbelievable creatures. We are manufactured to do an incredible job. And you know, I think most of us take better care of our cars and our equipment than we do of our body. And I want to talk about tonight making the body an important part of who we are. We believe, our belief systems are such in our culture that we are spiritually based beings. Well, being spiritually based beings, spiritually based beings can't very well enjoy a material world. They can't touch anything, they can't do anything. So we need what? A tool. Just like you need a tool to get around called a car. You're the animating force of that tool. You bring life to that tool. But it provides, with you giving it what it needs, the energy for you to guide, to go wherever it is you want to go. Well, we are incredible beings that have the capacity, because of our spirit, to animate this body and to use the body to do what we need it to do. But we've got to treat it well. We have to feed it well. What happens to your car if you put diesel fuel in the gas Ruin the engine. You don't want to do that. We have to treat ourselves in terms of what works best. We give our bodies what works best. I have given you uh, some handouts I think you all have them. And the handouts include, and by the way, um, can, can we put this on the computer so that people can print it out at home if they want to? Because this is a list of things in terms of the order in which we should consume them. Things that are the best for us, that are, are good for us, that are halfway good for us, all the way down to don't touch them with a 55-foot pole. Okay? 
because those are the things that nurture our body and give us energy and vitality and keep things from happening in a negative way called illness. We don't want that to happen. We have a responsibility to take care of this, just like if you don't take care of your car, it's not going to work. And there, with the list that you will get, those people who are watching on the computer uh, will get, and those of you who are here tonight, this uh, list is accompanied by a list of spices that may help you decide how to spice up your life without taking in too many poisons or things in the body that won't work very well. So what I am saying to all of us tonight is that we need to really take care of our body, give it what it needs, keep away from it everything that's poisonous and toxins and doesn't work. Because we create disease in our body by giving our body what it doesn't want and what it doesn't need. What may taste good, it may make us feel good, it may be easier to use than any other thing because we don't have to prepare it, we don't have to clean it, we don't have to do all those things. But I'm saying we need to do all those things because that's what creates wellness in our life. So please remember, you are responsible, I am responsible for this body. What we put into our body is how we are going to be 10 years from now or 20 years from now. I have a friend who is 102 years old who has never smoked a cigarette, who has never had any liquor except communion wine at church, who is extremely healthy, who exercises at the gym still three times a week, all of these things create wellness. That's what we want to do. That's what I want you to do. And I want to accentuate the importance of things in our life. There is one thing that is the most important thing in our physical life. Anybody know what it is? The most important thing. Justin, you know what it is. Yes. What is it? Oxygen. It's oxygen. If we don't have oxygen for about three minutes, what happens to us? What happens to our body? Death. Death. And what is death? Well, we have coined the word death to mean the end. But it doesn't really mean the end in its original meaning in the Aramaic language, which I'll explain to you later. But the point that I'm trying to make is that oxygen is so important to sustain our life that if we don't have it about every three minutes or less, our body will cease to function. So that is very, very important. And that brings me up to a thing about sleep problems. See, we can have deficiency of oxygen in the night when we're sleeping and we can die. We can literally die. And that's called a sleep problem. Sleep apnea is one of those problems. We need to be aware of that. Because when we are deficient in oxygen, if, we, if while we're sleeping at night, our breathing processes are, are askew, they've gone askew, they're not functioning properly, and we're getting less oxygen than we should, then what happens is we can create a chronic condition of low oxygenation, which eventually can kill us. And it can help foster all kinds of illnesses. So I'm recommending that periodically, we talk to our physician about an overnight sleep test. It will tell us what our oxygen levels are consistently throughout the night every couple of minutes. And sometimes we'll be shocked. And that's a wonderful thing because if you're shocked, you're going to do something about it. There are ways to correct that deficiency. There are ways to correct it. One of them, and the easiest one, which everybody hates, but I think it's wonderful, is a, a sleep apnea machine where you're hooked up to a thing that forces you to breathe, and it's no big deal. You get all the oxygen you need, you wear an oximeter all night, you measure your oxygen levels, and they're always way high, the way they're supposed to be. The next most important thing that we need is what? Water. water. If we do not have enough water, our body will not function well, we will develop chronic illness. What does water do? Two things. Remember, water does two things. Water flushes out toxins. It flushes out waste. Now, if we don't flush out waste properly and enough of it, it builds up in our body, gets back in our blood, and makes us sick. 
And it can create all kinds of illnesses. All kinds of illnesses. It's like this. What if in your house you had nine dogs? Nine dogs. And they were all hungry all the time and you fed them all kinds of things, constantly fed them. And they just pooped in the house. They never went out. And you didn't bother to clean it. What would happen? You would be living in filth, you would be sick, and you would die eventually. Well, that's what happens to us if we don't get rid of our waste. Water helps remove our waste, both liquid and solid. Both liquid and solid. Solid through the intestines. The intestines must be moist. Water is absorbed from the intestines and gets into the blood that way. It gets throughout the body that way. And it also, the water helps to push out the solid waste. We've got to get rid of waste. So water does, number one, gets rid of waste. If you don't have enough water, well, what would happen at your house if you didn't have enough water in your toilet? It wouldn't flush pretty soon and you'd be in a mess. We need water. Number one, get rid of waste. Number two, water is the prime component for every single thing our body makes in terms of fluid. Number one, blood. Where do you think blood comes from? The prime component is water, and our body manufactures it. If we don't have enough water to manufacture the blood in our body at the right consistency, what will happen to it? What if you have pancake mix, and it says, mix four cups of water with this package of pancake mix? and you only put in one cup of water, what are you going to have? You're going to have a mess, aren't you? You're going to have a big glob of paste, and it's not going to do anybody any good. If we do not have enough water to manufacture our blood, the consistency of our blood will be too thick. And if it's just a little bit too thick, think of this. The blood vessels in our brain are so small that it has been scientifically through brain scans discovered that many of those blood vessels are so tiny that it will take five of them to match one human hair. Now, if blood is just a little tiny bit too thick, what do you think is going to happen? Is it going to go through there, or might there be a chance that it will clog? And if it gets clogged, what is it called? It starts with an S. Stroke. A lot of strokes. It's called ischemic stroke which is a blockage. It can be a clot, but a clot comes from thick blood too, sometimes, and sometimes it, it comes from other causes. So we must drink enough water. How much is enough water? Enough water, discovered now by Dr. Batmanjela, who is a world expert on water, he has spent years and years using water as a prime treatment for many diseases, with good results. But he's come up with Every one of us should have about one half ounce of water per day, per pound of body weight, to do the two prime things that need to be done. Flush out waste and make the bodily fluids. And on top of that, he says, drink an extra 10 or 15 percent for good measure. So drink a little extra above the one half ounce per pound of body weight. And that will help our bodies function consistently, but we have to do it consistently. Dehydration is not a good thing. It is not a good thing. You had a question to ask me about something. I forgot what it was. Well, now that you're on the topic of water, does, uh, if you're drinking tea or salt, does that count towards your water? <clears throat> no. That doesn't count because tea and coffee have caffeine, and caffeine tends to be a diuretic. Caffeine happens to promote us to pee more, see? And that is, that is going to compete with the body's utilization of the water for the prime purpose. Got that? Although it will help you detoxify. It can help you detoxify a little bit. But I, I wouldn't count that uh, as water. Water, pure virgin water. Do not use water from the tap. 
Why? Because number one, water from the tap has chlorine in it. You do not want to, and some people say, why not? It kills germs. I want to drink that chlorine. No, you don't want to drink it because it gets in your intestines and it will kill it will kill the good flora, the good bacteria in your intestines and totally louse up the balance between the good bacteria and the bad bacteria and you'll be in trouble. And your elimination will be affected and you will begin to absorb toxic matter into your blood. you got to remember that the sewage passes through the intestines, which is honeycombed and lined with blood vessels, that that's how the nourishment gets in your body. It goes from, from that waste material, which isn't quite waste while it's being absorbed by all the, the nutrients are being absorbed. By the time it gets, your intestines are very long. By the time it gets down toward the three quarters of the way down, it becomes putrefied waste. And that gets absorbed into your blood. It gets absorbed into your blood. Now, we have to have good bacterial balance. That's why you've heard, who, who's heard of, of probiotics? Probiotics are good bacteria you load the gut with because you need that. It is estimated that about 70% of our immune activity takes place in the gut. And if the bacterial balance is inappropriate, that we will have problems with our immune system functioning. And we don't want that. So water, very important. The pure water is much better than the tap water. And you don't have to go to all ends and spend $4,000 for a damn machine to do all that. You don't have to do that. You want to filter the water and you find a filter or a filtering system that will take out the bad stuff. I don't want, and I'm not preaching to the world, I'm preaching to myself, I don't want any fluoride in my body. Fluoride, sure, some tests showed that it helped, it helped to eradicate a little bit, a little bit of tooth decay. Tests showed that. But it is a toxic poison. It, it is a residue from the manufacturing of aluminum. And they were paying millions of dollars to get rid of it every year. So the aluminum uh, cartel or business or organizations or whatever you call them, they marketed this byproduct of aluminum manufacturing because they did this study to put in the toothpaste. So I, I don't want to risk absorbing that toxic material, especially in my gums and in my right into my blood. I don't want that. So that's me. That's me. I'm not telling the world what to do. That's me. I don't want that. So we have to be careful the water we drink, okay? But drink enough water. Otherwise, we will slowly dehydrate. Dr. Vangela, yes, sir? Sparklets, arrowhead, that's okay? Oh, yeah, of course. All that water is good. But it's very expensive. You don't, you don't need to spend a lot of money on water. Uh, what we need to do is get a good filtering system. I have a Culligan filtering system in my house, and I have to have it serviced every year. It's reverse osmosis. Reverse osmosis uses a little bit more water. You waste a little water, but so what? It's worth it, and uh, it, it filters the water. It's absolutely wonderful. I have it tested three times a year, and it always tests out beautifully, and I use that water for drinking. But, you know, you'll find something that works. Just clean water, all right? Okay, that's enough for water. Is there any questions about that? No? Okay. Since water is one part oxygen, is there anything you can uh, drink that would increase your level of oxygen? That's a good question. It would be nice to drink water and not have to breathe, right? <laughs> it would be nice to go under the water and not have to worry about drowning. But no, oxygen is bound. It's bound in the water and you have to have a very sophisticated system to release it. However, there are supplements that you can buy that have oxygen molecules in them that will release, and when you drink it, they will help increase your oxygen levels in your body. They have one here. Uh, I buy it here. It's called uh, Cell Power, I think. And uh, I squirt it in the water and drink the water. I do that. And I also use it for topical uses. It, it, it's a healing agent if you use it in the right concentration. But in terms of drinking oxygen, not yet. But work on that. 
and you can afford to buy yourself a, a new spaceship. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions at all? Yes. So probiotics, how much should you take or having there are so many different brands and millions and 30 and 50 and billions? You know, I, I, have, I have a bottle that is, guarantees you 50 billion a dose. Well, I don't really believe we need 50 billion, but I take it once in a while. Uh, how much do we need? I guess it depends really on how depleted we are. If we are healthy eaters and we're not drinking chlorinated water and killing it off and we have good bowel movements, it is so important to have good bowel movements. I mean, that stuff has to come out. It shouldn't stay in there. If it stays in there too long, you're reabsorbing the toxins and you're creating illness in the body. You don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. So you talk to your physician, whoever they may be, and you work with them to be normalized, to be normalized. There are all kinds of things you can use. Probiotics, if you have the right combination of, of bacteria in your gut, it will help your regularity dramatically. If you don't, it will screw it up. So you want... Um, I, this is kind of gross in a way, I guess it's kind of gross. But we did some experiments and we were able to produce a 27 inch long bowel movement in one piece from one woman who was constipated. That's that long. That's pretty big, huh? Can you imagine that being in somebody's intestines and as it lingers in there? It's given off poisons, and those poisons are affecting our body. We don't want that. We want to keep regular. Well, that's why your best foods, worst foods, and better foods, and not-so-good foods list I gave you are important to look at because there's a lot of vegetables there, and that's very important that we have. A lot of people just eat a lot of meat and as few vegetables as they can get, and that's not great. That's not great. So anyway, the water we should be finished with now. We know water does two things. We know how much water we need to drink, and we need to start drinking it. Okay? Good. Now, I want to talk a little bit about, I, I used the word death before. I'm, I don't want to preach to you, but I want to teach you something that I think is important that we learn. There was a, a country called Aram. Aram. Aram has since been divided into Lebanon and Syria. Those two combined countries were one country called Aram. And in Aram, they developed a language called Aramaic. Aramaic is one of the oldest languages. And it's still one of the most pristine languages because it hasn't been bastardized enough uh, like English. I mean, I... I I don't know the English language anymore. You know, I, I come uh, t sometimes to Loma Linda Medical Center and they have a big hyperbaric department. And it's happened to me too at Dr. Whitaker's office and also here once or twice where some interns come in and they look at the chambers. You know, they're kind of weird chambers looking things, people laying in there like Cinderella or whatever, Prince Charming or whoever laid in the, those things. And They look there and they say, wow, that's cool. And another one will say, hot, man, that's hot. And I heard one kid from a nursing school, Concord Nursing School, walk in, he looked at those chambers and he said, sizzling, man, that's sizzling. <laughs> what does it mean? Our language changes so constantly that the meaning of the words of our ancient scriptures don't mean anything anymore. They don't mean what they really meant to mean. And there is an interesting word in Aramaic for death. And the word is moot. Moot means death. And you know how it's translated directly from Aramaic to English? This is what it means. To be present elsewhere. Not here, now. With emphasis on the now. 
So every time, and I refer to Jesus as a historical figure, I don't care what you believe, it doesn't matter, but as a historical figure, it's interesting to note his attitude about death. And every time he spoke about death, he was speaking Aramaic and referring someplace else, not here now. Not obliterated, not rotting in the grave, because death has nothing to do with the body in terms of the meaning of the word. And I'll tell you to what extent this, is, this can be understood. I grew up in the Aramaic culture. And my mother and grandmother and aunt would take me with them every other Saturday to L.A. to go to a market called Europa Grocery. It was on Figueroa Street. And the couple that owned it, Effie and George Habibi, owned a store in Long Beach. And mostly George was in the Long Beach store and Effie was in the L.A. store. We went to the L.A. store. And one Saturday we were there and it was a pretty big store. Effie was way over in the corner, and some man walked in, looked around, saw Effie, and said, Effie, where's George? And I remember so clearly she did this. She looked at him, and she says, Ah, he's dead now. And the guy went on and did his thing, never said a word. She was telling him that George was at the other store, mm -hmm. and he's from the culture, and he got it. Didn't have to say another word. Two Saturdays later, when we were there, this van backed up to the door and started unloading flowers. And my mother says to Effie, Effie, why do you buy so many flowers? And Effie said, honey, I don't buy flowers. Those are from people who hear me say George is dead who aren't from the culture. <laughs> they send me flowers because they think George died. <laughs> So my mother laughed, and I sort of laughed too. I was young, I don't know, seven years old or something. So I want you to understand the ancient meaning of the word death, okay? And here's kind of the scenario or possibility that we can put together with that. That we are, and I'm not trying to get you to believe anything. I'm talking possibility here. But I'm talking possibility based on a lot of factual evidence in terms of the use of the language. So, assume that we are created in spirit. But in order to really experience life, because life is more than spirit. Life is this world. Life is this stuff. Life is the chairs you're sitting in, the cars you're driving, the food, the solid food that you're eating. There is a materialistic element to life. In order for us to really experience life, we need to experience that part of it. We need to experience each other, each other's insides, each other's emotions. We can't do that without a body. So we're given the privilege of having a body. And when the body doesn't work anymore, like all things, all things won't work forever. Nothing will work forever. So when this body doesn't work forever, we give it up. It just ceases to work anymore. And we go back to spirit. That's the original concept of death. And I think it's really important for us to know that. Because we don't understand death. We don't talk about death. Death is, is something that is way out there somewhere. And we, we, don't, we don't deal with it. And I, I want us to deal with this possibility that comes from a fundamental foundation of a language. And the word death in Aramaic, we already know what it means. It means to be present elsewhere, not to be here now. Okay? And I want you to think about that. I want you to pray about that, put it in your brain, think about it. And once you accept that as a possibility, our faith factor will rise up. And faith is very important. How many of you want to be hopeless? Anybody? Nobody wants to be hopeless? How, how do we have hope? We have hope because we have faith. Faith opens the door to possibility. Possibility opens the door to hope. If we don't have hope, we're hopeless. Hope changes everything in our life. It is an extremely important thing. You know, we get all excited because we're sick and we think we're going to die and whatever. We're going to die anyway. We're going to die anyway. We will be someplace else 
You don't want to be in this body forever. I don't think anybody really wants to if they take a look at what happens to bodies. So we need to look at the possibility that faith brings us. And using the knowledge of the ancient language and the ancient traditions can help us understand a little bit more about the whole process that we call death. I want that to be clear and I want all of us to deal with it because we're all going to have to deal with it whether we like it or not. And it's not something to fear. I don't think it's to fear at all. And I, I would go on and on about that because I've had experiences, but I won't because I don't have time tonight. But maybe another night. So I, I will tell you one story, though, that, that has to do with faith. How much time do we have? Mm, half hour. Oh, okay. Well, I, I, I won't take that long, I don't think. I did a presentation at UCLA <clears throat> years ago on spirituality. And uh, there were about 800 people there. And I was warned ahead of time that there's going to be a group of atheists there and they're going to give you a rough time. I said, I don't care. I'll handle a rough time. In those days, I was much younger and I was ready to handle anything. So I gave my presentation. And toward the end of the day, we had a uh, uh, question and answer, Q&A, we called it. And I said to people, okay, now's your time to comment or ask me questions or whatever you want to do. And I was told that this particular woman who was wearing a particular thing was the head of this atheist group. And she was going to give me a rough time. So she got up and she said, well, I want you to know that I've been here all day. And I've heard everything you've said. And I've learned a lot from you today. But I notice that you have a lot of religious faith. And I think that's just a crutch. She said, you ought to just give that up and go for the world because you've got talent. She said, you've got talent. You could be a very rich man. You could have power. And I thought, oh boy, she's giving me this line. And I didn't know what to say. She said, your, your, your faith is a crutch. That's all it is. You don't need that crutch. <coughs> and I just prayed. I said, Lord, help me answer this question or comment. So I said to her these words. They taped it too, and I heard myself back, and I thought, did I really say that? Yeah, I did. I said, thank you for being so perceptive that I have a crutch. I love my crutch. I always keep my crutch with me, no matter what I do. My crutch helps me walk over slippery surfaces, over the rocks, up and down curbs, it helps me, in bad weather, stabilize myself. I love my crutch. And, you know, if there is nothing to what I believe at all, nothing, and I do what you call die, I'm not going to know it anyway. I won't know that my crutch was useless in terms of permanency. But I will have had my crutch all my life to help me, to stabilize me, to help me be strong. And at that moment, the entire auditorium burst into applause. And the poor woman that asked me the question sat down. And she got up later and she said, I'm really sorry it makes sense what you said. I said, okay, that's cool. I like that. I don't know where she's going to go with it, but she said it made sense what I said. So faith is important. And you know what? It is important to our physiological body and our mind in terms of healing. It is. If, if we are full of fear and anxiety, it is going to impede our healing. It will slow down our healing process. We have to set the stage of possibility for our healing process to be as effective as it can be. And then we supplement it by eating all the good foods and by keeping poisons out of our body and by not doing things that are going to promote bad things in our body. And you know, our system of medicine is askew. It really is. For years and years and years, we've done things and we've always had scandals. This last 50 years is going to be one of the biggest medical scandals ever. We, we worry about when they put leeches on us to suck our blood out and all those things they used to do. 
Well, we're doing worse things now. Why? I don't know why. At this point, I don't care why. But I think we're getting into, and the internet, I think, caused this. We're getting into a situation where big power bases cannot keep true knowledge from escaping anymore. Because there isn't any way they can control it. Everything's going out on the internet now. If you want to know how to treat this disease or that disease or what's working or what's not working, whatever the drug companies say doesn't have to affect whatever these small research programs are that happen and that work and that get put out to the entire world. So I think we're developing a stage of honesty that we've not had before. I think that's happening and I think that's a very good thing. But we have to keep in tune with it. We have to keep our attitude in tune with it. We have to develop a higher level of faith because faith leads to hope. And without hope, we're hopeless. Okay. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is one of the essential things about life is sleep. Sleep is very important. And I talked a little bit about the problems with oxygen at night and, and, and sleep deficit, and that's the medical aspect of sleep. Now I want to talk about the emotional side of sleep. We call a bedroom a bedroom because we go there to sleep. But most bedrooms I go into, don't get the wrong idea, I don't go into lots of bedrooms. <laughs> but most bedrooms I go into are anything but sleeping rooms. Every kind of electronic device, electronic devices, the rays and the beams of which affect you, all kinds of diversions, television set, radio, that's not sleeping room. We got to psych ourselves up, we we'll go in a room, that's where we sleep. You don't go to that room until you're going to go to sleep. You don't sit up and watch television and get all mentally activated and, and try to sleep. And you work on sleeping and talking to yourself and learning how to relax your body from head to toe and you go into sleep and you make sure nothing bothers you till you wake up in the morning. If you want an alarm, have an alarm. But try to create purity of environment in your sleeping environment. That's just a little bit of advice I give you. And if you slowly work on it and slowly develop it, you will increase the quality of your sleep. And it will increase the quality of your life. Okay? Any questions so far on anything? And I don't have all the answers, but all I have is explanations for why I said something. And those really aren't answers. <laughs> They're opinions, right? Okay, so raise your hand if you do. All right, there's another thing that I want to, this is from the Aramaic too. And I get a little bit religious sometimes, but I want you to know I do this for example, not trying to convert anybody. Wherever you are, you are, be it and love it, enjoy it and let it work for you. Jesus was born, grew up, had a following. And one of the things he taught was forgiveness. He said, you got to forgive all the time. And Peter one day was a little PO'd at him, I think. And he said, he said with an attitude, it seems, if you go to the, uh, back to the original scriptures, he, he, he says with an attitude, well, how many times should we forgive? Seven? And what was the answer? Anybody remember? Say it again. Seven times seven. 70 times 7, right? And what does that mean? That is the Aramaic equivalent of forever, of infinity. That's what it is. It is the Aramaic equivalent of infinity. Forgive, 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 forgive. But in our culture, we've never gone back to the word in Aramaic that is forgive, which is Shabag. We never went back to see what did it mean 2,000 years ago. And I'm going to tell you what it means, and it changes everything. And you'll understand why you need to do it. Shabag in Aramaic means forgive. That's how we translate it. But what it means is let go from your heart what you're holding on to that someone else did to you. You let go. Our concept of forgiveness is different. Our concept of forgiveness is let somebody off the hook. 
we let somebody off the hook, we forgive them. We're helping to clean up their act. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with get rid of the crap you're holding on to that's in your own body because it's rotting in you and it will kill you. And that's the truth. It's the truth. So to the extent that I forgive, I'm letting go of stuff that can create anger and hostility and resentment. You think that's healthy? Are you getting what I'm saying? I want to be sure you're getting what I'm saying. That's why I'm shrieking like a wild banshee. <laughs> yeah, there's something to be said about that, right? I watched, I was in Rome when Pope John Paul got shot years ago, many, many years ago. And I, I knew his secretary fairly well. And um, it was very interesting because after he got out of the hospital, he went to see Ali Aja, the guy that shot him. He went to the prison, and we were in Rome at the time, and they televised everything, live television, the meeting between the two of them. And it was amazing to me because I knew exactly what John Paul was doing. I knew exactly. He went there. He went there to let go from his own self the horror he went through when he got shot. And he did. I mean, he was in this Pope Mobile thing, standing up there, and this guy standing like this, shot the bullet here, it went up here, and an, an inch from the heart, it changed directions and came out this way. That's why he said, oh, Our Lady of Fatima saved my life. That's why he went to Fatima to thank her, because in the Catholic tradition, we have a very interesting relationship with Mary, the mother of Jesus. And he believed that. And whatever happened, happened, I don't know. But the bullet did go up and then it changed direction and went out. Didn't hurt him. Didn't kill him, I mean. So he went there to do the Aramaic forgiveness. And that's what we need to do all the time. We need to, you know what another word is? I, I said this to a seminar for teenagers. I said it the right way. It should be dump the, and the word starts with S. See, but I don't say that here. I, I change it to G for garbage. Dump the garbage. Okay? That's what forgiveness is. And I tell you, if you work on that, and each and every one of us have people that have hurt us, and each and every one of us have a reason to be angry, to be filled with all kinds of resentment and hostility, and some people have done it to us over and over again, and forgiveness, don't forget, means... And you've got to keep doing it because you've got to keep, keep the sewer cleaned out. Let it go. Let it go. Let it out of your heart, out of your reality, and it will no longer have power over you. You got that? Who, who didn't get it? You need me to shriek more? No? Okay, good. All right. I'm almost done. Any questions about anything I've said? And remember, they're all opinions, right? They're all possibilities. Because I really don't know a whole lot about anything. Yes, sir? We have a question from a patient regarding their hyperbaric treatments. Yes. And they want to know how long does it take for the process of angiogenesis to begin? Angiogenesis? That's a big word. What does that mean? The growth of new blood capillaries. It does mean that, the growth of small blood vessels, yeah. Doctor, could you repeat the question? Yes, the question is, how long does it take for angiogenesis to occur in the body under hyperbaric circumstances, correct? Correct. Okay. Angiogenesis is the process of the proliferation or the growth of tiny blood vessels. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy creates angiogenesis. And the oxygen, of course, doesn't hurt. It helps. But the real reason for it is the pressure. The pressure changes. When you go in the chamber, the pressure causes the blood vessels to go like this. And then the blood vessels, they, they retract. Then the blood vessels from the immune system, the immune system says this. immune system has a language. It says, Screw you, you're trying to hurt me. I'm going to grow and make up for it. 
So it starts the body to create these blood vessels. So you go in the chamber, you come out of the chamber, you go in the chamber, you come out of the chamber. You're challenging the body to create more blood vessels because you're contracting them. And then the body says, I don't want to be contracted, and that starts growing them. Contract and grow and contract and grow and contract and grow. And it starts to happen after a couple treatments. But a couple treatments doesn't make it continue to happen. You have to continue the treatments for a while. That's why we'll do, if we have a, a bad case of a diabetic foot, foot wound or some horrific athletic injury, like sometimes the football players get that, that breaks the skin and causes damage to the blood vessels, it, it takes a while to heal those. But they'll heal in half the time. They will actually heal in half the time. I can say to an athlete, injured NFL player, and, and the doctor says, you better, you better be on the bench. Being on the bench means not, you can't go in the game. You sit on the bench. You watch the game. You don't play in it. You stay on the bench for two months, eight weeks. I can say to them, you do hyperbarics every day, every weekday, and I'll have you back out of the bench in the game in four weeks. Okay? So it's the same principle. We're using the body to do what it does and activated by hyperbarics, the new blood vessels grow and the healing of the wound or the injury is done in half the time. The same is true with the, I have seen women come back from cosmetic surgery looking so bad, they looked like they just came out of the Taliban war. Awful, horrible, horrible. And some of the greatest uh, plastic surgeons, uh, cosmetic surgeons in Newport send their patients to us. We can have them back to work in half the time the doctor told them. And they can be healed up so quickly because that's what oxygen does. And it does that partially by angiogenesis because the areas that are constricted are unrestricted and the blood flow is increased dramatically and that's what causes the healing. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, good. That'll be on the test later on tonight. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Um, can you explain about the process? I'm very naive about it. I don't know about the hyperbaric oxygen. Yes. Oxygen, I said, remember, was the most important or is the most important element our body uses. And oxygen not only is the life-sustaining force for all living bodies, but it is the primary healing element. It actually is the healing element for every problem that is healable in the human body. And oxygen, if dosed properly, can promote healing quickly. Now, how do you dose oxygen? You dose a drug by milligrams. You need Cipro, you got a really bad infection, it'll give you 500 milligrams. You got a minor infection and you're a small person, it'll give you 150 milligrams. So if you really need more oxygen, how do you get it? Well, this is how you get it. There's a physical law. Whenever there is a pressurized environment, any gas in that environment will automatically dissolve into any liquid in the environment. That's a scientific fact. So let's go to Coca-Cola Bottling Company. We take a tour of Coca-Cola Bottling Company and we see all those bottles being capped and they're being pressurized and what do they put in them? Bubbles. They put carbon dioxide gas, they infuse it by pressure into the bottle or can or whatever and then instantly seal it. Okay? That's what they do. So they're causing gas to dissolve in the liquid and they cap it before it can escape. So when you open it, if you, especially if you shake it up, it all pops out, right? That's what we do in the hyperbaric chamber. You are in there under pressure in a closed environment. And the major gas that you're breathing is 100% oxygen. The same thing happens to your body as happens to the bottle of Coke. The oxygen is forced into your body in direct proportion to the pressure in the chamber. So if you have really bad wounds, 
you have diabetic wounds, you're going to amputate your leg, or you have necrotizing fasciitis, go, uh, go to, the, to the hyperbaric department. We have some photographs there, befores and after. And there's a photograph of a horse that was dying. Necrotizing fasciitis, that's called the flesh-eating bacteria. The horse was dying. And um, the horse finally got hyperbaric therapy and got healed completely. And all those people got healed. There's, there's I think, three more uh, ladies. Uh, one of them's a man and two ladies. They were really, really hurt badly, very badly. And we put them under pressure. We infused massive amounts of oxygen. We did it every day. In some cases, we do it twice a day. And they heal. They heal so magnificently. And some physicians won't even believe it. They don't believe it. See? But we can do it. It's done that way. So we dose oxygen by pressure. The pressure we put in the chamber dictates the level of oxygen that will dissolve into your blood. That's how we do it. Okay? And you're totally enclosed in this thing? Yes, you can come and play with us sometime. You come over there and, and we'll put a movie in and, and get your attention to the movie and shove you in there for 10 minutes and let you see what it feels like. Yeah, on the house too, see? Cool. And I, but I want to talk a little bit about hyperbarics too and the cost. Um, the cost of hyperbaric therapy, I'm not going to name the hospital, it's one of the most well-known hospitals in the, in the California area. Their charge for hyperbaric therapy, you know what it is, what is it? Just over $2,000? $2,080 per treatment. Yeah. So that's the way it is, you know, but... Our costs are much lower than that, of course. They have a bigger expense. I mean, hospitals have a lot more expense, but that's, that's crazy. Crazy justification. So will it also heal internal? Like if you had, say, um, you know, ulcers or something? It can help heal anything that needs healing if it's not exacerbated by a condition that the oxygen won't deal with. If it's a normal healing situation, it will promote healing, yes. And it does some other things, too. Like it, uh, high levels of oxygen, cancer cells don't really love that. It doesn't kill them off and send them screaming, shrieking in the night. But it does slow down their rate of replication, and they don't like it. So that's a good thing, yes. So you're saying it's healing at an accelerated rate. It what? It's healing at an accelerated oh, rate. Oh, much, much accelerated rate, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why if you have, uh, well, we have lots of athletes and the athletes don't like to admit who they are. They come in and they pretend to be somebody else and that's fine. We know that. Uh, but, but we can heal them quickly. And a lot of teams now are buying chambers. They're buying chambers, but they have to be very careful with it because 35 or so years ago, the FDA declared oxygen a drug. See, God created oxygen. How wonderful. The FDA validates his creation by declaring it a drug. <laughs> so it's now a drug. And if an athlete uses it before a game, he is guilty of drugging. So when they have a hyperbaric chamber, they don't even want anybody to know they have it for fear they'll suspect them of using it before a game. But they use their chambers for healing. Yeah. And they have a, a heck of a good time with it. Okay? Are we, are we done? Anything else? Any other questions? Okay. If not, if you'd have them, just raise your hand. Um, I want to re-emphasize, want to re-emphasize that we are responsible for this incredible body that we have. We are responsible for it. We should do everything we can to give it the very best. And a lot of giving it the best means keeping the crap out, huh? That's what it means. And we don't need all that stuff. I mean, we got the whole world advertising, eat this, eat that, eat that. If we eat all that stuff, we're going to die soon, too soon. We don't want to die that soon. It's garbage. Most of the stuff we buy in the store is just ludicrous. We, we, we don't need all that stuff. We have to dehabituate ourselves. We are living in a state of habituation. We have a habit of doing what the media tells us to do, we eat what's advertised, we eat what's easy, we go to the fast food place, we eat stuff that creates a lot of glucose in our body which promotes cancer, it promotes diabetes. We're, our, our nation is a diabetic nation, it's a mess. It's a total mess. 
I, I was in charge of Dr. Whitaker's uh, wellness program at the Institute, and we had our patients live with us. They came and lived with us. He rented a, a floor on the hotel and had caterers make food and whatever. And uh, we had our own little police force. If we caught him at the bar drinking booze or at the candy shop in the hotel buying candy, we'd throw him out. So you don't want to, you spend thousands of dollars to be here. Go home. You're wasting your money. We don't want you here unless you're going to do what you're supposed to do. And most of them would reform immediately. <laughs> And you know what? We used to get rid of diabetes in about 60 to 90 days. Get rid of it. No more diagnosis as diabetes. Changed everything. Only by what you put in your mouth. Or what you don't put in your mouth as well. Yes. It's another question about uh, oxygen, doctor. Um, now, isn't oxygen created with sunlight and plant life, which equals photosynthesis? Well, um, photosynthesis is the process by which plants derive nutrition from the sun and um, green plants create oxygen and they breathe if they breathe they absorb carbon dioxide and they transfer that's why it's so important when you hear these scandals about millions of trees dying we need greenery in order to counterbalance the effect of the millions of cars that I understand uh, one year, about four or five years ago, Toyota and their related companies made 10 million cars. 10 million cars, one company. So what's that going to do to the environment? We need more trees to make up for the gases we're putting into the environment that need to be converted by the greenery back into oxygen. Exactly. Yeah. And so that means we have to, since the sun is so awesome, we need to make solar cars, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that's going to happen eventually. But you know, we want to preserve, humanity wants to preserve what it's doing. I went out of sight, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I forgive. I go to confession tonight and <laughs> make up for my evil. So uh, we, we have a big challenge. We have a big challenge. It's not easy. Not easy to deal with it. No, not at all. You know, the challenge we're going through in medicine now, we have an entire empire built on some diseases. And this whole thing about... I can take a person with diabetes... And I am convinced that in 80% in of the cases, if they do everything we tell them to, we can reverse the diabetes and we can heal their wounds with the hyperbaric treatment. But there's, there's a multi-billion dollar business that is dependent upon amputation. Do you know how much an amputation costs? From diagnosis through removal through rehabilitation, through prosthesis that's making a fake leg, and physical therapy, about $130,000. You know how much hyperbaric treatment they need to get rid of the damn problem? About $6,000. You'd think the insurance companies would want to pay the $6,000 rather than $130,000. But no. No, we're still in that, that area where... It's, it's standard medicine that has to be adhered to. See? It's a bigger cut for the broker. Whatever, you know, I don't know. I, I, I have my theories, but I... And by the way, you know, I've had a very exciting life. I got shot at once uh, because I was very verbal about certain things. And my secretary was driving me from, uh, from uh, uh, Pasadena to San Bernardino and I'd gotten a threatening phone call. We were on our way to Romania to treat AIDS babies. And uh, they had a lot of AIDS babies. They, they infected them by buying blood from, uh, from Brazil to give AIDS babies uh, these, these blood fortifications, which are mini transfusions. But the blood was all tainted with the AIDS virus. So we went there. We had hundreds and hundreds of babies. We treated them. And we were very successful, actually, with what we did. But I was warned not to go to Romania. The head of the, of the health department over there, the, I guess the Minister of Health, Dr. Dabescu, invited us to go because he knew we were working on some stuff that might help, and we did, and, and it worked. 
But I got this call, and the call said, uh, um, you shouldn't go to Romania, it's bad for your health. And I said uh, some very bad words to them and hung up. And the next hour, Jerry Marie was driving me. We were all getting on the freeway. We got shot at with guns. They, they, they broke all the windows of the car, but they didn't hurt us, thank God. So anyway, I'm done now. Are we done? Time's over? Well, everybody, whoever's watching around the world and on Mars, God bless you all. Thank you for listening. And we look to hear you, or you, you look to hear me again, and I'll be back. Goodbye. Okay.